Number 16. Camellia Ann Ford Late one night in March 2023, a woman from Florida almost crashed her SUV into a police cruiser parked in Palm Beach County. The officers that the vehicle belonged to were conducting a traffic stop nearby, but the close call forced them to switch their attention to the driver who almost hit their car. Later identified as 25-year-old Camellia Ann Ford, the young woman behind the wheel complied with the officer's instructions at first. When asked how much she'd had to drink that night, she admitted to having two cocktails as well as a glass of wine. Ford agreed to undergo a series of field sobriety tests. Unfortunately, none of them went well. During the first test, the suspected drunk driver was laughing and smiling throughout the instructions as if she wasn't taking the situation seriously. In the second test, Ford was asked to walk in a straight line and made a comment about how it made her nervous like ballet class. Based on her performance during the tests, the police officers concluded that she was most likely drunk, so they arrested her on suspicion of DUI. Ford was heard saying, oh goodness, as she was placed in handcuffs and taken to booking. She seemed genuinely shocked that she was getting arrested, almost unaware that she'd essentially just bombed all of her field sobriety tests. The outcome of her case is currently unclear. Number 15. Dean Davis Police officers in Brickton, Oklahoma were heading back to their station at 2.11 a.m. one morning in March 2023 when they suddenly noticed a few customers drinking on the patio of a bar called Skinny Slims. It's illegal for bars there to let customers drink on the patio past 2 a.m., so the cops stopped at the business and informed everyone that they weren't supposed to be outside. A man in the crowd later identified as State Representative Dean Davis was allegedly argumentative with the officers and showed signs of intoxication some of which included red watery eyes and slurred speech. According to an official police report, Davis identified his position in the government and said that he would have this conversation with law enforcement the next day as if he was trying to get special treatment. The police were in no mood for his arrogant behavior, though. They handcuffed Davis, who responded in disbelief that he was being taken into custody. He even told the police that they had no right to detain him. An officer informed the enraged politician that he was not being detained, but that he was actually being arrested. Davis responded by yelling to fellow representative T.J. Marty that he was being arrested for standing still. One of the cops clarified that they were arresting Davis on a public intoxication charge before placing him in the back of a patrol vehicle. Inside the car, Davis asked the police to grab his state representative ID card out of his wallet and read the writing listed on the back. He also instructed them to call their head officer to deal with the situation. The back of Davis's card said that senators and representatives were exempt from being arrested during or while traveling to and from legislative sessions at the state capitol. When an officer told Davis that he wasn't in the legislature or at the state capitol, he continued to insist that the cops needed to call their supervisor to the scene. He also repeated his previous statement about how the cops shouldn't be able to detain him, but they did, and they made sure to remind Davis that they'd given him ample opportunity to peacefully leave the bar before placing him under arrest. The arrest report noted that Davis made several remarks during the drive to county lockup, saying that he felt sorry for the officers and that they'd see how the situation turned out in the end. And while most politicians publicly apologize after an embarrassing outburst, Davis initially insisted in a public statement that he'd done nothing wrong. Shortly after the arrest, the Oklahoma House voted to censure Davis. As a consequence for his actions, he was banned from participating in all committees until issuing a public apology. He finally gave in almost a year after the incident in February 2024, when he submitted a written letter of apology. Davis acknowledged that his behavior fell short of the high standards expected of a public servant and said that he had immense respect for law enforcement. He also expressed a commitment to righting his wrongs and making sure sure that a similar incident does not happen in the future, but essentially admitted that he sent the letter just to get back on committees. A few hours after presenting the letter, Davis reportedly said that he didn't feel the need to apologize when he felt like he'd done nothing wrong. This wasn't a politician's first brush with the law, either. Davis's arrest for public intoxication came only 20 days after he finished probation for a DUI charge from 2019. He settled a more recent case by pleading no contest and was instead ordered to pay a small fine. Number 14. Christopher Police 
Before even arriving at the scene of a disturbance call in 2021, Police Sergeant Christopher Police was already a bit frustrated. The Sunrise Florida officer was called to a convenience store where he had a few ideas of what he might find. He approached the scene as the original responding officers struggled to get the suspect, Jean Simelin, into the back of their squad car. In a disturbing outburst that was caught on body cam footage, police threatened to rip Simelin's soul from his body and pointed his pepper spray towards the suspect. Hoping to de-escalate the situation, a nearby female officer pulled the sergeant away from the vehicle, only to have police switch his aggression to her by grabbing the woman's neck and pushing her into another police car. He then walked back to the vehicle where the suspect was detained, slammed the door shut and offered a few harsh words to the officer who stepped in. The footage was leaked a couple months later and police was placed on administrative leave while an investigation was conducted. After realizing that he was under scrutiny by his superiors, he sent a text message to officers under his command, begging them not to air their dirty laundry to anyone outside the platoon. He later was accused of downplaying the incident before he knew that body cam footage was under review. At that point, he allegedly claimed that he responded aggressively to the female officer because he simply didn't know who was touching him and thought they could be a threat. The department eventually concluded that the female officer acted in accordance with their protocol, even if police didn't like her stepping in when it seemed like he was getting out of control. In July 2022, he was criminally charged with battery on a law enforcement officer, tampering with evidence, assault on a law enforcement officer, and assault against a suspect. He has since retired from his position, and the criminal case seems to be ongoing. Number 13. Dylan Lemmer in July 2023, Seminole County, Florida Sheriff Dennis Lemmer announced that his 19-year-old son Dylan had been arrested on charges of reckless driving and eluding law enforcement. A deputy saw what looked to be two cars racing and tried to pull over a speeding Ford Mustang at about 8 o'clock in the morning but the driver just sped away. In keeping up with the department's policy to not pursue fleeing vehicles over traffic violations, the deputy didn't chase after the car. He only found out that the driver was the sheriff's son after his efforts to identify the suspect later on. According to a police report, Lemmer momentarily lost control of his vehicle and accidentally fishtailed as the deputy tried conducting a traffic stop. He then continued driving recklessly, making it seem as if he had no intention of pulling over. Luckily, Sheriff Lemmer treated the case like any other, saying that while he does love his family dearly, they, like everyone else, are not above the law. After learning that he'd been identified as the driver, Dylan Lemmer turned himself in and cooperated with the case as it moved forward. And while being the sheriff's son didn't spare him from criminal charges, he was lucky enough to have his mugshot withheld from media outlets. Number 12. Patrick Scruggs as a former U.S. federal prosecutor, 38-year-old Patrick Scruggs used to make a living by holding criminals accountable. During his time with the U.S. Attorney's Office from 2012 to April 2023, he worked on over 500 different cases in the Middle District of Florida, including a few against accused rioters who were arrested after the January 6, 2021 Capitol riot in Washington, D.C. But he now finds himself on the other side of the law, as he faces allegations of stabbing a civilian. Around 9.30 a.m. one morning in September 2023, a driver passed out while on Tampa's Howard Franklin Bridge. He was slumped over the steering wheel, and his vehicle was blocking traffic, prompting a nearby concerned civilian, Ahmed Gahaf, to get out of his car and approach on foot. Gahaf knocked on the incapacitated driver's window, but the seemingly unconscious man remained unresponsive. As the Good Samaritan went back to his car to look for something to break the window with, the driver suddenly woke up and stepped on the gas. His Lexus crashed straight into Gahaf's vehicle, at which point he threw the car into reverse and crashed into Scruggs's car. Scruggs allegedly got out of his car in a violent rage, smashed the Lexus driver's window and repeatedly stabbed a man with a pocket knife. According to a police report, bystanders tried to intervene, but they ran away when Scruggs tried to stab them. A passing St. Petersburg police officer saw what was going on and arrested Scruggs, who now faces felony charges of armed burglary, aggravated battery, and aggravated assault. The victim was given treatment for serious but non-life-threatening injuries, and Scruggs is free on bail pending the outcome of his case. His trial is scheduled to start in May of 2024. 
number 11, Patrizio Martinez. A 20-year-old Colorado man's life was tragically cut short in September 1994 when a drunk driver crashed into his motorcycle outside the city of Denver. The drunk driver, 56-year-old Patrizio Martinez, was discovered hiding in the bathroom of a church near the scene of the accident. His blood alcohol content was over two and a half times the legal limit, and he had four past drunk driving convictions under his belt. It took only three trials for a jury to convict Martinez of DUI and vehicular homicide. The judge sentenced the repeat offender to spend 24 years in prison. When Martinez was eligible for parole, the victim's family attended every hearing and voiced their objections to him being released. He ended up serving 18 years behind bars before getting out in 2013. After killing another human and spending all that time in prison, you'd think that Martinez learned his lesson. But just three years went by before he was caught driving drunk again in 2016. The arrest came after a state trooper pulled him over for driving at night with no headlights. With a blood alcohol content measuring 0.86, Martinez was barely over the legal limit for driving. Still, considering his record, he was arrested for his sixth DUI and was sent back to prison for violating parole. Martinez was released again a few months later. Of course, the pattern repeated. It was only a matter of time before he got caught drinking and driving again. In April 2018, a police officer saw him drinking beer inside his truck. He refused to submit to a breathalyzer test and was arrested on suspicion of his seventh DUI. The case was still pending four months later, when Martinez was arrested again for an eighth charge. Despite his history of driving drunk and continuing to do so even after killing someone, Martinez walked away without a felony conviction and without serving any time in prison. In what's known as a deferred sentence, he was placed on probation and told not to drink alcohol. Deferred sentences are typically just for first-time offenders, and they're definitely not meant for chronic offenders who show no signs of changing. Martinez's son later wrote in a letter to the judge that his dad started drinking again right after receiving the deferred sentence. As of 2019, Martinez was still free and was also still drinking and driving. His case was featured as part of a Nine News investigation into whether or not Colorado's recently strengthened DUI laws have helped curb the state's drunk driving problem. According to the news outlet, hundreds of drunk drivers avoided felony convictions despite the introduction of a law that automatically makes a person's fourth DUI charge a felony-level offense. If that's actually the case, then it's no wonder so many people seem to think they're above the law. Number 10. Sean Hopwood Sean Robert Hopwood was the poster boy for reformed prisoners after spending over a decade in prison on a federal bank robbery conviction. He started his sentence in 1998 at Illinois' Pekin Correctional Institution. Over the next 10 or so years, he spent a lot of time in the prison's law library and became well-versed in his knowledge of legal matters. Jailhouse lawyers have been a fixture at America's prisons since before law libraries were commonplace at U.S. correctional institutions. But Hopwood was no ordinary jailhouse lawyer. In 2002, he prepared paperwork that won a fellow inmate a Supreme Court hearing. It was just one of eight cases the court granted hearings to that year out of more than 7,000 that were filed by prisoners who couldn't afford filing fees. At the time, Hopwood wasn't an actual lawyer, so he couldn't put his name on the documents or officially take credit for any of them. In 2005, he helped another inmate win a Supreme Court hearing, and he prepared paperwork for several other prisoners whose cases were eventually heard by lower courts. Hopwood officially became a practicing attorney in Washington in 2014, six years after he was released from prison. He became a law professor at the prestigious Georgetown University in 2017, and in 2020, he hired Donald Trump's daughter, Tiffany, as a research assistant. After years of being on a constant upward trajectory, Hopwood was arrested in 2023 for domestic violence after an altercation with his wife, Anne-Marie Hopwood, at their home in Washington, D.C. According to a Daily Mail exclusive, police officers went to the residence after getting a 911 call claiming that Hopwood was keeping Anne-Marie locked up in the basement. Hopwood allegedly told responding officers that his wife was actually at a concert in Maryland. But this wasn't the first time cops were called to the house, so they decided not to take Hopwood's story at face value. An officer who'd interacted with Anne-Marie in the past sent her a text to see if what her husband was saying was true. She responded quickly that she was inside the house. 
The officer, J.P. McArdle, reportedly found Anne-Marie with a broken finger, a chipped tooth, and other injuries that were sustained in a fight with her husband three days earlier. According to Anne-Marie, the fight started during an argument while leaving a baseball game. Hopwood allegedly threw Anne-Marie's phone in a parking garage and drove away without her. She had to take an Uber home, where the fight continued. In a complaint, Anne-Marie accused Hopwood of shoving her multiple times after she got back to the house. She also wrote that her husband ordered her to stay in the basement during visits from Child Protective Services and the police. Anne-Marie detailed three separate incidents involving alleged physical abuse that ended in hospital visits. The disturbing details include shocking allegations of Hopwood physically abusing his wife, including shoving, slapping, punching, and slamming doors on her. He also stands accused of taking Anne-Marie's phone and refusing to let her leave the house. During one trip to the hospital, a worker noted that her injuries were likely the result of domestic violence. In another incident that happened while on vacation, Anne-Marie wrote that Hopwood left their hotel room with the couple's two children after a heated argument. He allegedly told his wife that he was taking the kids to another hotel for the night before taking them to the airport and flying back to Washington, D.C. without telling her. Anne-Marie was completely unaware that she'd been left all by herself. According to the most recent updates on the case, Hopwood is free on pre-trial monitoring during the ongoing case. Shortly after his arrest, a Georgetown spokesperson confirmed that Hopwood was no longer teaching at the university. The court also granted Anne-Marie an order of protection, but it's unclear whether or not the couple is still together or if a divorce is pending. Anne-Marie met Hopwood when he was in prison. She was friends with his mom and wrote him a letter after hearing about him. The rest is history. She stood by him throughout his entire sentence and has been by his side ever since. But everyone has a limit and nobody deserves abuse, so it's hard not to hope that Anne-Marie will close this chapter of her life and move on to bigger and better things. Number 9. Thomas Callan as a self-proclaimed sovereign citizen, 61-year-old Thomas Callan from Mansfield, Massachusetts seems to think that following the law is optional, so it's not surprising that he's been arrested several times. In 2023, he allegedly stole a gay pride flag. The case was still ongoing, along with other pending motor vehicle offenses, when the police executed a warrant at Callan's house in April 2024. He was wanted for not appearing in court for his previous cases, which were trivial compared to the world of legal problems he's now facing. During the arrest, a few members of law enforcement gathered enough information based on their observations of things inside the home to get a warrant for a more thorough raid later on. Local detectives consulted the Federal Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives, better known as the ATF, and the state bomb squad before carrying out the second search based on their suspicions that illegal weapons were in the home. During the raid, authorities seized almost two dozen guns, over 10,000 rounds of ammunition, and items that can be used for making improvised explosives. Callan is currently being held in custody on his previous warrants and is expected to face six weapon-related charges, including unlawful possession of firearms, unlawful possession of a large-capacity firearm, and possession of explosives. If there's anything to learn from Callan's current predicament, it's that a person has every right to not recognize the government's or authority, but it's not going to spare them from being held accountable under the law, just like everyone else. Number 8. James Ross Dumas 40-year-old James Ross Dumas from Eagle Mountain, Utah, had two previous drunk driving convictions and had been charged with driving drunk earlier in the day when he allegedly caused a car accident involving at least five different vehicles in August 2023. According to police officers, Dumas was arrested that morning for domestic assault, refusing a chemical test, and drunk driving. He bonded out of jail not long after his arrest and apparently continued to drink. Twelve hours later, Dumas's car drifted out of its lane and into oncoming traffic. He smashed into four vehicles but was the only driver who received serious injuries. After being airlifted to a hospital and getting treatment, Dumas was booked on another DUI charge as well as criminal mischief and assault. In addition to all of his more recent charges, Dumas has two prior DUIs from the early 2000s, as well as aggravated assault, aggravated arson, and drug-related convictions from 2008. Number 7. Jeff Payne 
In 2017, footage of a Utah police officer assaulting a nurse went viral. The incident started when Salt Lake City officers brought a suspected drunk driver to the emergency room with injuries from crashing into another car head-on. One of the officers asked for a blood sample to be taken from the patient, but the on-duty nurse Alex Wobbles refused to comply. She said that the situation didn't meet the legal requirements, which include the patient being under arrest, a warrant being issued, or the patient giving their consent. The policy Wobbles was refusing the blood sample under is not actually a state law, but it was a rule that the hospital said the police department needed to agree to, which is why the nurse was unwilling to go against it. Detective Jeff Payne tried convincing Wobbles that the suspect had given implied consent. Footage taken by another hospital employee looked to show Payne ripping the staff member's phone straight out of her hands. The angry cop was also seen dragging Wobbles out of the hospital while she screamed that she didn't do anything wrong. Wobbles was handcuffed and put in a police cruiser for 20 minutes before being released with no charges. But she believed that what had just happened to her was extremely wrong, so she hired an attorney and released surveillance and body cam footage of the incident. The police department made a public apology to Wobbles and Payne was put on leave pending the outcome of an investigation. In the meantime, the Salt Lake City Police Department received heavy backlash from the public, who disapproved of Payne's treatment toward Wobbles. Payne was supported by the police union but ultimately lost his job thanks to his inappropriate conduct. The hospital changed its blood drawing policy to make it clear that implied consent is not enough to justify taking a sample. Wobble settled with the city for $500,000 and donated some of the money to efforts geared toward making it easier for civilians to obtain police body cam footage. She also donated to the Utah Nurses Association and became a leader in their end nurse abuse campaign which is led by the American American Nurses Association. Payne insisted that he didn't do anything wrong and continues to maintain his innocence, despite the widespread criticism he's received for the behavior in the videos. He sued the city for wrongful termination and was later hired at the Weber County Jail as a part-time civilian corrections assistant. Number 6. Brian Donaldson Former Arkansas defense attorney Brian Donaldson's career abruptly ended in January 2021 when he was accused of assaulting a young woman from Phoenix, Arizona. A few months later, he and three co-conspirators were arrested on federal human trafficking and kidnapping charges stemming from the assault incident. The cases were still pending as of early 2024, when Donaldson was arrested twice in one day for drunk driving. His first arrest of the day took place in Crittenden County, Tennessee, where he was booked into the local jail for DUI and refusing to submit to a blood alcohol test. He was released a few hours later, just to be booked back into custody again later that night. Donaldson enjoyed about six hours of freedom before he was hit with another set of charges for refusing blood tests and driving under the influence. This time, he spent five hours in jail before being released. In the grand scheme of things, the drunk driving charges are no big deal compared to the federal charges Donaldson is currently facing. In that case, he's accused of knowingly disregarding the fact that the victim was being forced to participate in a sexual act. The outcome of the disgraced attorney's legal problems has yet to be seen. Number 5. Charles McGonigal During his time as the special agent in charge of counterintelligence at the FBI's field office in New York, Charles McGonigal hid his association with Russian oligarch Oleg Deripaska while helping with investigations into Deripaska and several other foreign billionaires. Deripaska is a close ally of the Russian president Vladimir Putin, who became rich during the post-Soviet privatization of industries that were once owned and operated by the government. A few years after retiring in 2018, McGonagall investigated one of Deripaska's rival oligarchs in exchange for bribes and payments. McGonagall was sent the payments through shell companies in an attempt to eliminate obvious connections to the money source. Little did either of the men know, McGonagall was already under investigation by the FBI. The agency had started looking into his activities about three years earlier, after he was seen meeting with a suspicious associate. In 2022, McGonagall used his connections to try getting Deripaska off the US government's list of parties who were sanctioned after Russia invaded Ukraine. According to the US Department of Justice, McGonagall revealed limited details about his work for Deripaska to friends. He insisted the work was completely legal, but wouldn't identify his boss by name, referring to Deripaska simply as the big guy. He was ultimately accused of receiving hundreds of thousands of dollars in secret payments 
payments for his work for Deripaska and others, including an unnamed Albanian businessman. McGonagall also traveled with Deripaska for the purpose of advancing business interests. The retired FBI agent's shady activities caught up with him in 2023, when he was arrested by the agency he once worked for on multiple charges, including money laundering and violating sanctions. A few months later, McGonagall pleaded guilty to money laundering and conspiring to violate the International Emergency Economic Powers Act EPA. He was sentenced to spend four years in prison for the crimes he committed on behalf of Deripaska and an extra 28 months for his dealings with the Albanian businessman. Number 4. Romero Cabral da Costa Neto A Brazilian lawyer's career advancing opportunity in the United States ended with a prison sentence for insider trading. 33-year-old Romero Cabral da Costa Neto came to the States on a one-year visa back in 2022 for a job at the prestigious Gibson Dunn & Crutcher law firm located in Washington, D.C. He was picked up by the FBI almost a year later, in August 2023. According to the U.S. Department of Justice, Costa opened confidential client files using the law firm's database while searching for non-public information that he could exploit for financial gain. He made several trades using information he learned about upcoming mergers, lawsuits, and other things that were more than likely to have a profound effect on stock values. Costa profited at least $50,000, including $42,000 thousand dollars that he pocketed from a single trade. But he was ordered to give back almost all of the money after being convicted of unlawful trading. He also had to spend two months in prison before getting sent back to Brazil. The Gibson Dunn law firm fired Costa after his arrest, and it's safe to assume that they won't be giving him a good reference for future job opportunities. Costa's defense attorneys argued that while insider trading is taken extremely seriously in the US, where the maximum prison term is 20 years, it's hardly ever prosecuted in Brazil. On the rare occasion that someone is prosecuted for it, the person typically doesn't serve time in prison. And while this difference between cultures doesn't excuse Costa's actions, the defense asked the judge for leniency based on their client's cultural perception of insider trading as a trivial offense. But lawyers are smart people, and Costa knew he was in another country where things are done differently. It's hard to believe that he had the unsuspecting ignorance his lawyers tried to portray in court, and the judge decided that it was only fair to hold him accountable, just like any other defendant. Number 3. Nico Irizarry in January 2022, law enforcement in Lee County, Florida, got a tip claiming that one of their deputies had falsely arrested someone for drug trafficking. Investigators soon discovered that fentanyl was planted in the suspect's car, and that he wasn't aware of the contraband's presence in his vehicle when he was taken into custody. During questioning, 26-year-old Nico Irizarry confessed to arresting the man on behalf of a co-conspirator who offered to reward him with a trip to Paris and certain favors. Prosecutors claimed that Irizarry's accomplice, Charles Costudio, had a vendetta against the victim. A third suspect, Scott Snyder, was also accused of planting the drugs in the victim's car while pretending to be a real estate agent. According to authorities, Custodio told Irizarry where to find the victim so he could pull the man over and conduct the bogus arrest. Custodio and Snyder were later charged with drug trafficking, conspiracy, and possession. Irizarry was fired from his job on the force and charged with falsifying an official document. He ultimately pleaded no contest to an official misconduct charge and was sentenced to serve a year in jail. Two months into his sentence, Irizarry asked the court to reduce his ruling because he suffers from liver disease and needed access to medical care that wasn't available in jail. It's unclear whether or not the request was granted, but he's free now and has hopefully learned a lesson that dishonesty doesn't pay. Number 2. John Rosa between 2010 and 2018, a 52-year-old man named John Rosa worked at several large multinational law firms. He made tons of money during that time, so in theory, he should have paid a lot in taxes, but he didn't pay anything. In the meantime, he enjoyed a luxurious lifestyle, which included a house in Bronxville, New York, that came with a multi-million dollar price tag, as well as an Aston Martin sports car. 
Rosa later resigned from the New York bar in 2020. By 2022, he owed the IRS at least $3 million in unpaid taxes. Instead of trying to take care of his debt problem, he filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy, which allows the debtor to keep all of their assets while renegotiating their financial situation. The application was approved based on Rosa's claim that he was going to receive a substantial amount of money that would allow him to settle his seven-figure IRS bill. But the money never actually came, and Rosa failed to make the payments as promised. According to federal prosecutors, he lied about the cash he expected to receive to retain control of his assets. As a result, his Chapter 11 bankruptcy was dismissed altogether, enabling the IRS to go after his house, car, and other possessions in an effort to regain some of the money that was owed. Rosa was also charged with making false statements. Rosa's attorney argued that his client filed accurate tax returns and didn't try to get out of paying his taxes, but that he was only trying to buy himself time by saying that he expected to receive a large amount of money. In September 2023, Rosa pleaded guilty to abusing the bankruptcy system by making false statements under penalty of perjury and submitting falsified records. He was sentenced to the time he'd already served and three years of supervised release. Seems like he got off easy, if you ask us. And now for number one. But if you want to hear even more stories, stay tuned for some extra content that you might have missed. Number one, Daniel Waxman. Some lawyers do a great job at studying the law, but are bad at following it. One example of this is 56-year-old Daniel Waxman of Cedarhurst, New York, who made plans to meet up with a teenage girl for illicit purposes in May 2023. He went to the agreed-upon location in Ramapo and found out that he'd actually been interacting with an undercover investigator who was posing as a teen. In a press statement following the attorney's arrest, Rockland County District Attorney Thomas Walsh revealed that Waxman spoke with the undercover agent for over a week and that his messages grew increasingly inappropriate as time went on. During that same period, the undercover investigator repeatedly mentioned that she was only 15, leaving no doubt as to whether or not Waxman was knowingly communicating with someone he thought was underage. Waxman was charged with a felony count of trying to disseminate indecent materials to a minor. After his arrest, he was dropped from the Brian Cave Leighton Palina International Law Firm. He pleaded guilty in April 2024 and is currently awaiting sentencing, which is scheduled to take place in July. The disgraced attorney could face up to seven years in prison and five years of post-release supervision if convicted. 9. Alan Blackthorne 35-year-old Sheila Bullish married Texas millionaire Alan Blackthorne in 1982. However, the couple started having problems in the late 80s after Blackthorne was arrested for hitting Sheila. He pleaded guilty and claimed that it was a one-time thing. But by then, Sheila was done with the marriage. She filed for divorce, and the ensuing court battle was ugly. Police were called to the estranged couple's home numerous times to mediate heated arguments. Sheila ultimately won custody of the couple's kids, and she met a new man who she moved to Florida to be with. Sheila was trying to move on with her life, but Blackthorne couldn't let go of the failed relationship. He couldn't stand to lose, and he continued to harass Sheila even after she moved away and remarried. In 1997, the millionaire hired a private investigator to track down Sheila's whereabouts. Three weeks later, someone shot Sheila dead and cut her throat right in front of her kids. People were quick to point the finger at Blackthorne, but he had an alibi. He was golfing that day, and there were witnesses who could testify to it. But all it did was make detectives question whether he hired someone to kill his ex-wife. Investigators uncovered evidence that he'd offered to pay people to murder Sheila on numerous occasions. A man named Jose Luis del Toro agreed to do it for $14,000, and Blackthorne seemed to think there would be no way to connect him to the crime. To avoid blame, he tried to point the finger at Sheila's new husband, Jamie Bullish. Del Toro was located in Mexico and extradited to the U.S., where he confessed to the crime. He said that he had watched Sheila from afar before approaching and killing her, and he almost backed out after seeing that she was a loving mother. But in the end, he made the horrifying decision to follow through with the murder. 
Blackthorne continued to deny any involvement in Sheila's death, even after being convicted of conspiracy to commit murder and receiving two life sentences. He died in prison in 2014 at the age of 59, but his cause of death was never disclosed. 8. William Booze 55-year-old Florida native William Booze landed himself in hot water with the law in 2022 when he was accused of stealing millions of dollars from wealthy clientele who utilized his services as a private jet travel broker. His alleged theft began in 2017 and went unnoticed until he tried cheating a Manhattan art gallery out of $1 million by booking unauthorized charter flights to its American Express account. Company employees noticed and confronted Booz, who claimed the charges were made in error and promised to refund the money. He sent the gallery a collection of forged documents to make it look like he'd redeposited the funds back into their account, when in reality, he never did. In 2020, Booz allegedly forged a journalist's signature on two charter flight contracts and scammed the company out of $63,000 in order to pay for travel expenses. Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg accused Booz of thinking he could fly above the law by making unauthorized charges with his clients' credit cards, amounting to over $4.5 million in thefts over a three-year period. He was ultimately charged with grand larceny, criminal possession of a forged instrument, and several other crimes. At the moment, it seems as though he's still waiting for sentencing. 7. Philip Barron In 2013, a drug boss was handed an 18-year prison sentence after it was discovered that he'd made more than 30 million pounds, 36.6 million dollars, smuggling heroin and cocaine into the UK. British drug kingpin Philip Barron was among a small group of very rich men who headed a massively profitable international drug trafficking ring. He owned homes in England, Ireland, and Spain, where he carried out six-figure drug transactions while posing as a legitimate businessman. Barron and his associates often corresponded in code to prevent authorities from understanding what they were talking about. They were extremely organized in everything they did, and while it helped them get away with their illegal activities, it also helped get them caught. Investigators managed to uncover the organization's meticulous financial records, which detailed specific drug transactions as well as details about laundered money. Based on the information they revealed, the men moved 18.4 tons, 16,692 kilograms, or 16.7 metric tons of cannabis over a 17-month period, profiting to the tune of around 3.2 million pounds, 3.9 million dollars. Barron is said to have made around 30 million pounds, 36.6 million dollars, from the cocaine trade. Authorities believe Barron founded the criminal ring around 2000. During the enterprise's heyday, the group lived carefree, lavish lifestyles. One of Barron's associates, Paul Yearsley, was extremely confident that law enforcement wouldn't catch up with him, even to the point of being boastful. He went as far as to feature his multi-million dollar mansion that he bought with drug profits in a home magazine. The headline of the article he was featured in was Living the Dream. But the dream didn't last forever for Yearsley or any of the other men involved in the gang. Yearsley was eventually convicted of drug smuggling and was sentenced to more than five years in prison. Barron received an 18-year prison sentence in 2013, and 27 other members were also criminally punished. They won't have fancy mansions to return home to upon their release because the British government took control of their assets and is moving to sell them as a way to seize some of the operation's profits. 6. Jeremy DeWitt Jeremy DeWitt lost his opportunity to become a police officer when he was convicted of crimes that automatically disqualified him from the job position. The Florida man didn't let it stop his imagination from running wild, though, and he pretended to be a cop to his heart's content, even after it started landing him in some serious trouble. He served his first sentence for impersonating an officer in 2003, 
but he jumped right back into it when he regained his freedom. DeWitt even started his own force of wannabes called the Metro State Special Services, who rode around in cruisers and on motorcycles that looked like real police vehicles, equipped with flashing lights and sirens. They made sure to avoid using their lights in certain jurisdictions, in other words, where they were more likely to run into cops. When the police did confront them, they maintained that they were just a volunteer group of funeral escorts. This band of fake officers became such a big concern that some even compared it to a cult. In one YouTube video, DeWitt can be seen weaving through traffic on a motorcycle at high speed with his lights flashing, while he orders members of the public to pull over. At one point, he called a woman in a car an inappropriate name. Based on the shocked look on her face, she likely believed DeWitt was a real cop, and she dialed 911 to report a member of their department going off the rails. His YouTube channel reportedly contains a plethora of disturbing videos of him pulling over and harassing civilians, and otherwise asserting authority he doesn't actually have. By 2021, DeWitt had at least 10 open cases against him throughout Florida for impersonating a police officer. However, he cut a deal with prosecutors and received an 18-month prison sentence, followed by four years of probation. Under the agreement, he would not be allowed to own any police-like gear or equipment, and he was prohibited from presenting himself as an officer in any way, shape, or form. Just months after his release, he was arrested for violating his probation since he failed to remove videos of himself pretending to be a cop from his YouTube channel but DeWitt claimed that he was hacked and that he no longer had access to the channel. When he was taken into custody, he said, I'm not going back to prison today, I'm not. But he didn't have a choice in the matter and he was held without bond. Five, Tracy Hunter. During her time as a judge in Hamilton County, Ohio's juvenile court system in 2014, Tracy Hunter sought information about a case against her brother, Stephen a youth corrections officer who was accused of striking a young offender. Tracy allegedly passed her findings on to Stephen, who was ultimately fired. She was accused of misusing her position and influence to pass confidential information on to her brother. Possibly in an effort to help him keep his job, Hunter apparently used her position to acquire documents about Stephen's accuser and she then shared what she found with her brother. In 2014, she was convicted of having an unlawful interest in a public contract. The case languished in court for years as Hunter appealed her conviction. A judge upheld the ruling in 2020, and she was subsequently sentenced to six months in prison. Hunter has remained adamant that she broke no laws. When the sentence was handed down, she went limp in the courtroom and had to be carried out. Her case remains controversial to this day, with many believing that racism was a factor in the decisions and rulings against Hunter. However, others have accused her of playing victim to the system. 4. John Pickens When the wife of a school resource officer in Tennessee reported her husband for abuse in 2022, authorities took her claims seriously even though the case involved one of their own as he was a 16-year veteran of the Knoxville Police Department. The woman told investigators that her husband, John Pickens, choked her during an argument, to the point where she couldn't breathe, and that he hurt her again the next day, leaving her with visible injuries. Pickens was put on administrative leave, and his police powers were revoked pending the outcome of the case. In the end, he was charged with aggravated domestic assault. It marked the latest in a series of cases involving criminal allegations against Knoxville police officers. Just a month before Pickens was arrested, two of the department's officers were hit with drunk driving charges within a few hours of each other. In another case, two officers were accused of helping to cover up racism going on within the workplace. One of them resigned during an investigation, and the other was fired. Knoxville Police Chief Paul Noel said that the alleged actions of the officers who've come under scrutiny in recent years don't reflect the department's mission and values. He reassured the public that police aren't above the law, 
and that those who commit crimes are going to be held accountable. Altogether, 10 officers have resigned or been fired since 2019 due to suspicions or allegations of misconduct. 3. Mary O'Connor Tampa Police Chief Mary O'Connor and her husband were riding their golf cart without a license plate one evening in 2022 when they were approached by Pinellas County Deputy Larry Jacoby. During their conversation with the deputy, O'Connor asked him if his body cam was recording, and he confirmed that it was. O'Connor then quickly flashed her badge and identified herself as the Tampa Police Chief, then said, I'm hoping you'll just let us go tonight. The deputy decided to comply with the chief's request, and before parting ways, O'Connor handed Jacoby her card and said, Call me if you ever need anything, seriously. She likely wasn't expecting people to find out about the incident, but they did, and she admitted that her way of handling things could be viewed as inappropriate. In a statement, O'Connor said that she had expressed great remorse to the mayor, and she apologized to Tampa's residents for her poor judgment. She further added that she didn't mean to put the deputy in an uncomfortable position, and offered to pay any citations that her mistakes warranted. In the end, O'Connor requested the same discipline that any officer would receive for similar conduct. 2. Eugene Price A crime boss and his associates thought they were untouchable, but they were brought down by English police in 2013. Eugene Price was the leader of a crime ring based out of St. Helens that supplied large amounts of illegal drugs to the area. He knew that the police were aware of who he was and that they suspected him of serious crimes, but he thought he was smart enough not to get caught. He felt this way because he was far removed from the street-level operations of his organization. Police engaged in a long and complicated investigation to identify the gang's hierarchy and uncover proof of the high-ranking members' activities. In addition to distributing drugs, Price and his henchmen had access to illegal guns, which they used to maintain order among the organization, as well as during turf wars with rival gangs. Most of the criminals working under Price were members of a traveler community, known for being tight-knit and wary of outsiders. So they weren't exactly the easiest group of suspects for investigators to tap into. It took some time, but they eventually obtained the evidence they needed to put together a criminal case against eight people, including Price, in 2013. After taunting police about how they'd never catch up to him, he was convicted of conspiracy to possess a firearm with intent to endanger life, conspiracy to commit arson, and conspiracy to supply Class A drugs. He was sentenced to 25 years in prison as a result. For their involvement in the crimes, his associates received varying sentences, ranging from four years to 21 years. 1. Shelby Coniglio Officers in Florida pulled a vehicle over in the middle of the night in early 2022 and found themselves face to face with an off-duty Pinellas County Sheriff's deputy who seemed to be intoxicated. They would later describe how 26-year-old Shelby Coniglio allegedly displayed telltale signs of drunkenness, including slurred speech and bloodshot eyes. They also reported that she had a distinct odor of booze and she appeared to be unsteady on her feet. Coniglio did poorly on field sobriety tests and had a blood alcohol content of 0.2, more than twice the legal limit for driving in Florida. She was consequently charged with one count of DUI with a BAC over 0.15 and she ended up losing her job in accordance with the sheriff's office policy. Records show that she began working for the sheriff less than four years before her arrest and was a deputy in the patrol division. Thanks for watching. Would you rather go viral for acting like a stereotypical entitled millennial toward a cop while avoiding any serious consequences, or spend a month in jail for having an attitude toward a judge while being spared from the existence of embarrassing body cam footage? Let me know in the comments below.